Uh, this is probably one of the greatest compliments a pastor can give any pastor, any church, anywhere. And I honestly don't say this just everywhere. But I li- if I lived close to this area, this would be my church. I-, I, would, I would be at this church, yeah. Y'all know how to bring it. Y'all know how to worship. And I've heard, I've listened. I, I, it's another compliment because I go by some of the churches that I know I can lean into. And, and I listen to some, some of the people I've heard here speak. Uh, y'all don't even know I've been listening to you on some Wednesdays. And, and I told one of the guys earlier, I heard you speak on a Wednesday night. And I wasn't here. I was watching. And I've listened to Pastor Mauricio. Not only can you bring worship, they bring the word. Come on. Amen. And so, uh, and, and the greatest thing that we know about your pastors, not the fact that they're just great friends and they're great pastors, but everywhere we go, people that know them speak highly of them, very highly of them. And in the ministry, that's vitally important, that it's not just something they do on Sunday. It's the character and the conduct and the behavior they carry wherever they go across the globe. So you should give it up for your pastors. They're the greatest. They're the best. Yeah, honestly, they are fantastic. And... Um, the teamer has been fantastic. We love their kids and Alexis and Isaac. And uh, we even accept Elliot. He's okay. Um, <laughs> we're just going to throw him in the mix because if not, you know, he's, he's bigger than me. But, uh, no, really we do. And, and just the team in general. Jasmine's been so fantastic. Uh, the, 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 the ones that's been walking me through things, fantastic. So thank you so much. And I see so many familiar faces, people that we just got to know last time we was here and, and got to, re, uh, you know, kind of rekindle and recatch up a little bit today. And that's fantastic. So uh, my wife sends her love. She wished she could have been here. The last time we was here was during your family. I think it's family conference, and we shared our testimony a little bit. Some of you remember that. And uh, she sends her love. She wish she could be here, but somebody's got to pastor our church, and she's there making sure everything's going very well. And uh, we appreciate your love. We appreciate your support. Love everything about you. We do me a favor. Uh, everything, everything today felt at home. You run your service like we do. Your order of service is just like ours. My, my, this is my microphone I have at home. I feel like I'm at home uh, with just your family here. And so do me a favor. Let's make a declaration of faith. Get your Bible in your hand, whether it's a Bible, your smart tablet, your iPhone, your drawer. It doesn't matter. Make this confession with me. Repeat it with me out loud and proud. Father, Father. come on, everyone together. Father, Father. oh, y'all are on it. This is your word. Your word word is spirit, spirit. truth, Truth. and life. Life. You are my life. I come now now. with open eyes, open ears, ears. an open heart, and an open mind mind. to receive everything everything. you have for me in your word from this day forward. I will be forever changed into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Come on now, someone give him praise. He's worthy. Yeah, come on. How many, how many love your pastors? How many love your church? How many, how many just wants to serve Jesus here at this church? Fantastic. Well, if you're not on a team, and you might say it on a time, I serve in my giving, I'm one of the kingdom builders, whatever you call yourself, I can tell you one great thing you can do for your pastor, and I'll speak in behalf of him, although he didn't tell me this, and I'm going to speak, and he might say, please don't say that, I don't think he will. If you attend this service, and you could find yourself getting up earlier and coming to the 8 o'clock service, that would be a big blessing to your pastor. I know this because that's always the service that's difficult, and this is the service where everybody brings their guests, bring the lost, bring those who do know Jesus, and you could really serve in such a capacity. It wouldn't take much of your time. It might take a little sacrifice to get out of bed after you went to the club all night. (laughs) And everybody in the club getting tipsy. (laughs) You come to church, Jesus will take care of your hangover. It's okay. He'll take... Y'all know I'm just messing with you now. <laughs> but, but seriously, if you could make the 8 o'clock service, maybe you've been in this service long enough, you're a creature of habit, but if you can make room in this service, it would bless your pastors, it would bless those who don't know Jesus, amen, to be able to come in. Can you say amen? amen. All right, come on, let's go to the Word. Y'all have been talking about see beyond. I love that thought. I love the idea of looking beyond where we are, beyond our circumstances, beyond what might be surrounding us. It's an, it's an act of faith. We have to have eyes of faith to see beyond anything that's not visible. You have to have eyes of faith. When we talk about see beyond, it means see beyond just the, the temporary situation, see beyond just right now, see beyond your circumstance, see beyond just today. We talk about setting goals this time of year. I know it's popular. Uh, when I go to my gym, I hate January because it's like there's no machines open. All the machines are taken. You have to wait. Your workouts take longer. And I just think, okay, it's okay. March is coming. They'll all be gone. And, and my machines, my, my weights will be open again. Y'all know what I'm talking about? 
and because we're setting goals. There's a difference between goals and vision. Goals you set, you know, to turn over new leaves. We make a resolution. We break a resolution. But if you have a vision, you have something that's a God-given destiny. You have something from God that's your purpose that you were born. There's something you know on the inside of you that God has breathed into you. You can't let go of that. There's no part of you that can say, I'm okay not doing this. I know who I am. I know whose I am. I know who I'm called to be. I have my identity in Christ at this point in time in my life. It took me some time to get there, just like it takes everyone some time to get there. But once I showed up and I tasted of God's gift in my life, God's future concerning me, I saw his destiny for my future, I could not let go. And see, here's the thing. You have to find what you're passionate for that God's placed in you. I know I, I love to speak. I, I enjoy it. This isn't the part I enjoy the most. I know that I'm called to do this. So next Sunday, if I had a church or didn't, it wouldn't matter. I'm going to speak wherever I'm at. Come on, y'all with me? In, in fact, here's one of the greatest things you can ever remember. Preach the gospel everywhere you go, and when necessary, use words. How about our attitude shows the love of God? How about our disposition shows that we honor God, we love God, we love others, and we serve the world? How about that? I was in the car, and I won't name any names because some of them, some of them names you may know. And we were pulling into a parking lot. There was about three of us and our minister, minister friends and family, wives were in the car. And we pulled into this parking lot in a certain city, and we had to pay to park. And as I handed the $10 bill and the gentleman in the booth handed me the parking pass back, the Holy Spirit said, ask him if he knows Jesus. And so I just took a moment. I said, can I ask you something? Do you know Jesus? And he said, well, I, I know who he is. I, I, I mean, I, I've heard of him. I said, but, but have you made him your savior? Do you know if, you ended your, if your life ended today, would heaven be in your future? Do you know your eternity is okay? And he said, yeah, man, I can't really say that. I said, do you want to know? Because I could pray that prayer with you right now. It's a simple prayer of confessing Jesus as your Lord and asking him to forgive your sins. Do you want to do that? And he said, yeah, I, I'd like that. And so I just led him through the sinner's prayer right there. And he grabbed my hand afterwards and he said, thank you. Thank you so much. And we pulled away and one of the pastor's wives said to me, KG, you just led someone to the Lord. And I looked around and said, yeah, that's what you call preaching. <laughs> See, preaching isn't standing right here on this platform right now. Some of you might be aiming at the stage, but you're never going to be on the stage until you learn to preach where you're at. See, I never put people on the stage that's not preaching wherever they go. I don't train people to speak up here if they're not telling the good works of God wherever they go and sharing the love of God wherever they're at. Come on, y'all. Everyone say, see beyond. Everyone say, see beyond. How about see beyond your minuscule thought? How about see beyond you think the stage is the arrival? How about seeing beyond the fact that you think you sing better than the person with the microphone, but your attitude's so bad we don't want you on the platform? How about see beyond that it's not you being seen, it's, it's you being seen serving. Now, I don't even know who that's for, but it's for someone. So come on, everyone just open your heart and take it. Because ministry and serving is not about being seen. It's about being seen serving others. It's not about sitting in the room until the service starts and walk out like you think you're God's gift to the people. No, God's gift to the people is to you. And we are to be, we are to be releasing eternal life through our words, through our heart, and through our love to them. Can you say Amen. So when I talk about seeing beyond, I want to talk about how we live this thing called faith day to day in the challenges that we face. It doesn't matter to me how good you are on Sunday when the music's going good and you're excited, you're inspired, you're all hyped up because that second song got under your skin, it got into your soul. I want to know how you walk on Monday, Tuesday, hump day, Thursday, Friday. <laughs> Come on, everybody, hump day! I want to know if you're the same Christian on Wednesday when you want to punch your coworker in the throat. I, I want to know if you carry the spirit of anointing or the spirit of Jesus or call it the spirit of love for those of you that wonder what that means. I want to know if you love your neighbor when you leave the church instead of just shake their hand and smile with some type of facade on Sunday morning. Amen. I want to know if you're genuine, and that's what God wants to, he's calling us to this authentic, genuine faith that says, it's not just when you're in the house of God, it's because you are the house of God. We carry the Holy Spirit within us, and we've got to carry him in such a way that when we walk into a room, light has appeared and darkness must go because the love of God has lit the place up, amen? Yeah. 
I, I remember I used to go to the place and get lit. <laughs> Come on. When's the last time you walked into the place and lit the place up? When's the last time you showed up and there was light there and you didn't just get lit? You were so lit the place got lit. Come on, everyone say hashtag lit. <laughs> so if you want God's, if you want God's vision for your life at 20 and beyond, 20, 20 and beyond, you, you got to learn to carry it in your heart. You got to understand it's something we do 24 seven. It's something we walk out. It's a call that we have on our life. That's more, come on, it's more real to us than just playing church. We are the church going forward. So sometimes we know the vision. Sometimes we know what God's given us, but challenges come. And when challenges come, it gets difficult. That's when we have to know that we got faith in Jesus that is real, that we got the authentic faith in Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. And so when things get hard and challenges arise, it's easy to go, well, I believe it when I see it. Anyone ever heard those words? I believe it when I see it. Hey, let's flip that. Let's just flip that. Let's say, I'll see it when I believe it. How about that? Write that down, you know. It's instead of having that cynical attitude that says, I'll see it when I believe it. How about when I believe it, I'll see it. In other words, it takes faith to develop out of nothingness something God wants to birth into your heart. Into that void that you say is nothing, God's already planted things there. But you've got to, inst- you've got to install and invoke your faith there for those things that are not to be called as though they were. For God to plant in you what he sees is greater than you've already seen. So you've got to be able to see it through the eyes of faith and you've got to see the invisible world and you've got to call those things that are not as though they were. Amen? Amen. So I think that's vitally, vitally important. But if we're not careful, challenges can bring uncertainties. It's the promise. Look at the promise of God concerning us. I love looking at the promise. I love living a promised life. I love the promises of God being revealed and released in my life. But I think back to like the Israel children when Moses led them out of Egypt. The promise looked different than the road they had to take to get there. Some of you, you got that promise, you believe it, you got a call, you got a vision, but then you got challenges and you found the road to the promise is actually tougher than the promise itself. That the road to the promise is what keeps people from receiving the promise because it's on the road that looks so difficult. It's on the road that has the challenges. It's on the road where we face the obstacles. It's on the road to the promise that we get thrown curveballs. And it's on the road that we've got to look properly at through faith so we can continue and see beyond the challenges. So we want to talk about seeing beyond the day-to-day challenges. And here's what I want to read in Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, verses 25 through 33. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned. There was 12 spies, remember, that were sent out to spy the land. 12 spies. And they came back to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh. In the wilderness of Paran, they reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore and is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the, the Republicites, the Demites. <laughs> Just so you know, people have been calling other people out for a long time. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. Ever say, we can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. And all the people we saw were huge. I see huge people. I don't know how you feel, but look at me. I see huge people everywhere because I'm just a little bitty guy. Everywhere I've gone, I see huge, well, except for Jonathan, he's shorter than me. We found that out, Jonathan, sorry about that. <laughs> these people, these pe- sorry, Jonathan, these people, these people must have been huge because 
It says huge people, then it differentiates talking about giants. These people are huge, and then there's giants. We saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. So how do we see beyond our daily challenges? Let me give you a few things to write down, just a few thoughts and principles to take home so we can grow together. Here's the first one. Number one, we ha- have a we can attitude. Come on, everyone say, have a we can attitude. See, some of you have a weekend attitude. We have to have a we can attitude, right? We have to say, I believe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Maybe I'm not up to the challenge, but the one that possesses me is up to the challenge. In verse 27, we see where they talk about the fruit of the land. There were literally two men with the pole holding the fruit on a pole because the the fruit was too large for one man to carry, too heavy for one man to carry. It talked about milk and honey. It talked about all those things, but it said there's giants, there's walls. It's scary in there. And I will say that when we get the promise of God, when when we get the calling of God, we get the purpose of God. We, we hear God begin to build dreams and visions into our heart. It's exciting. But then all of a sudden when you begin to see the walls and you begin to see the giants and you begin to see and we begin to see all the obstacles, it can be a bit intimidating to think that we are not up to the challenge. The good news is right here. Here it is. You're not up to the challenge. I'm not up to the challenge. God never called me to do anything I could do on my own. That's why the Bible says just do my works. And as you do, you'll glorify God because the people will know you weren't capable. It had to be somebody and something more powerful than you. Come on, amen. And in spite of negativity, Caleb said we can certainly take them. We can certainly do this right now. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand. Some of you are standing right now with the fruit of your promise in your hand. Some of you right now, God has provided a dream, a vision, a future, a hope. For some of you right now, you're standing with that fruit that's so wonderful, milk and honey flowing through your life, but you're seeing the things that are scaring you. You've got your eyes set up on things that are stopping you, and you've got the the fruit of your future right there, and God said, just trust me. And believe we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on. (laughs) What if people say we can't, but we just decide we can't? Well, yeah, but pastor, what if it doesn't work? Yeah, but what if it does? Yeah, but pastor, what if I fail? Yeah, but what if you get back up and you try again? The Bible says the righteous will fall seven times, but they get back up. Come on, look at somebody say, get back up. And by the way, it didn't say the imperfect fall. It said, though the righteous fall. And you are righteous in Christ Jesus, but you're going to mess up. You're going you're to be the one sometimes with mayonnaise on your face. You're going to be the one with something little green in your teeth and everybody's looking at you. But you've got to get back up. Can you say amen? amen? Hardships must come or will come, but we must decide our attitude before they arrive. Look at Numbers 14, verses 7 through 9. They said to all the people, this is Joshua and Caleb talking now, the two positive spies. The land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. I love that. Don't you love that? Write this down in your notes. A we can attitude knows that God is included in the we. Let's be like Caleb. Look what God said about Caleb in verse 24, Numbers 14. But my servant Caleb, this is a different story. He has a different spirit. He follows me passionately. I'll bring him into the land that he scouted, and his children will inherit it. 
I don't know about you, but I don't want to be thrown into the majority of the negative people. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but you'll always have more negative people around you than you, you will positive. That's why we encourage you to be in the house of God. That's why we say come congregate as the church in this building. Because all week long, there'll be people telling you what you cannot do. Telling you why you shouldn't dream. Maybe even your family, your parents, your brothers, your sisters will tell you. You can't accomplish that. That's a pipe dream. We say come to the house of God. Come to L. Elevate church because around here they're going to elevate your life. They're going to encourage you. They're going to strengthen you. They're going to tell you what you can do because here they don't have the spirit of negativity. They have the spirit of a fighter. They have the spirit of a champion. They're going to tell you what you can do because this church carries a we can spirit. Amen. Come on. What spirit are you carrying? Are you choosing to? crumble under the pressure of the majority or are you deciding that you're going to speak out no matter what? Here's the second thing we need to know if we're going to face these daily challenges and see beyond. Number two, know who you are. Know who you are. Everyone say know who you are. Y'all remember being young and trying to discover who you were? Y'all remember that? When I was younger, this is going to crack some of y'all up, I was a cowboy. I kid you not. I was a cowboy because Urban Cowboy was popular. Y'all remember the movie Urban Cowboy? Oh, yeah. I was cowboy. And back then, there was a guy named Johnny Paycheck. He had a song called Take This Job and Shove It. That's the closest I could get to the Christian without my dad whooping me that I could sing a song and say what I want to say without really saying it. You know what I'm saying? So I bought me a big straw hat, and I had a big pheasant feather in it. I had white boots with brown tips. Levi's and I was Urban Cowboy. Oh, yeah. Until Saturday Night Fever came out. <laughs> Y'all remember that movie? You can't tell by the way I use my walk. You know what I'm saying? And then I bought an Angel's Flat suit. Huh? Big collars, popping the collar, out big collar. Huh? And I bought some white jazz shoes with the little tan trim. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I didn't know who the heck I was, right? And now I, I, I had to come to places like some of you. You don't really know who you are. You're still trying to find your identity. You're still trying to discover what life's about. And here's the truth. When you discover who you are in Christ, it won't matter what anyone thinks about you. It won't matter if your neighbor's got more than you or they think they got more than you. It won't matter what clothes you're wearing. It won't matter what car you're driving because your identity's wrapped up in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Huh. The, 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 the negative spice says we can't do it. There's giants. We can't do it. We look like grasshoppers in their eyes. We looked at grasshoppers in our eyes, and I know that's what they were thinking. Here's the thing. It is so easy to have a negative image of ourselves, isn't it? I, I still fight it because I got these little short arms that look like T-Rex when I clap. <laughs> Let me hug you. I want... My wife tells me all the time, honey, don't cross your arms when you preach. It looks funny. <laughs> it does, right, because they're so short. My friend's 5'6". He's got longer arms than me. I got these little legs. I'm torso. They call me torso boy. I'm all, I'm all tor torso boy. Right? I got ugly feet. Ugly. Ugly feet you ever saw in your life. No, no. I don't care how ugly your feet are. They have ugly feet right here. In a, in a couple of weeks, we're doing a thing called the Barefoot Mile. We're walking for sex slaves out of Cambodia. And the news people are going to be there. And they're gonna, they said, we want to take video camera pictures of all your feet. And I'm like, oh, heck no. This will go viral for a bad reason. Trying to see if they got little slip-on feet you can put on. You know what I'm saying? Good-looking feet. You can slip on over your feet. <laughs> Truth is, that used to bother me. It really did. Till one day I realized who I was. And I read the scripture that said, how lovely on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news. And I thought, all I got to do is bring good news. And I don't care what you think about my feet. There's some beautiful feet I got down there. <laughs> no, they got bunions. They all gnarly. No, no, they beautiful. They got, I'm bringing good news. And as long as I got good news, I got beautiful feet. Amen. Look at someone and say, you need to have beautiful feet. <laughs> and when you get a poor self-image, here's what's happening. You automatically think everyone else thinking that about you. You probably wouldn't notice my short arms if I hadn't talked about my short arms. <laughs> yeah, some of you are like, yeah, I saw. <laughs> no. 
Hopefully you find Jesus before this service is over. Because I know you're going to hell. There ain't no doubt in my mind. So, 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 here, so here's the thing. You didn't notice, but all of a sudden, if I, if I really felt intimidated about it, if you didn't, even if you didn't say anything, I start thinking you're thinking about my short arms. And how do I know that? Because they said, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes, and they thought that too. Isn't it amazing how poor self-image can give you the power to read someone's mind? They must be thinking they look like grasshoppers too. You walk into a room, you're automatically thinking people talking bad about you because you have a bad image of yourself. They weren't even thinking about you. You're just a narcissist. You're not really that important. We had a lady come to one of our campuses at our dinner with pastors and said, Pastor, it's just so hard to come into church because I know people think about my past. I said, that's funny because I don't even know nothing about your past. <laughs> well, yeah, you had to hear the story. I said, I don't even know your name. I just met you for the first time. Yeah, but no, she had this image that I knew her story, that I was judging her. No one's judging you, not at this church especially. Even if they know your past, they're not judging you. Your own heart's condemning you. Stop it and start knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. The past is called the past because it's past. That's deep. We only have right now. Everyone say right now. You, listen, here's a principle. You've only got right now. Until right now. Now you've only got right now. Until right now. And I can't go back and change right now two, two right nows ago. And I don't even know where I'm at right now. You're getting the point. You cannot go back and change anything. And I don't, I'm telling you right now, this was not like my first sermon. So this is for someone specifically. You're so worried about your past, it's killing your present and it's destroying your future. You got to let go of your past, realize who you are, redempted, redempted in Jesus Christ, and your past is forgiven. Let it go. Everyone say, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. My granddaughters would be loving me right now. Sing, Grandpa. Grandpa, sing. My wife and I were, were pastoring, and some of you know the story, so I won't, I won't meditate on it or stay on it long, but we were pastoring. We were married young, pastored our first church seven and a half years, married 10. I lost my mind, literally was manic depressive bipolar disorder, had some things that took place. I had moral failure. I had a couple affairs in my marriage, destroyed my marriage, destroyed my family, lost our church, lost our family, lost our house, lost everything. Uh, went through psychiatric care that put me on 1,200 milligrams of lithium. Uh, for seven months, God worked on me, worked on my mind through my divorce. God healed my mind. After seven months, I went off my medication, and God completely healed me. If you're here on medication, I'm not saying go home and throw it away. It's a long process that we would talk about some other time. But after that, God began to work on my wife's heart. God restored our marriage after about a year and a half of divorce and separation. We got back together, started the Rock Church after a few years. And uh, four months after starting it, we're coming home one night. A diesel truck runs a red light, hits our family, me and my wife and three kids in the car. Broke my wife's neck in two places, broke her back in three places. She has over five pounds of metal down her spine. They had to cut her from ear to ear and rebuild her face. Every bone in her face was shattered. You would never know that because she is beautiful. I mean, she walks the room and I go, <laughs> After 36 years of marriage and being together 40 years, she still, come on, she still rocks my boat. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. And, and so you can't tell. But it also killed our nine-year-old twin son, Brandon. So I understand daily challenges. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I've not had every day that was just like the anointing of God and you must walk in this bubble. No, my life has been freaking shattered through the years. Even after I did the right thing and God restored my marriage, we come to start the church we're in now. And four months after that, my wife goes through this and, and all of a sudden my son's killed. No, I, I think I understand challenges. I think I do understand what it is to live faith in the middle of hard times to overcome and to see beyond. I got to see beyond the image of watching my little boy die in the backseat of my car as he closed his eyes that night. I got to see beyond the day they buried him and I watched him put him in the ground. I got to see beyond. I got to see beyond the pain of what that put my other son through who went through 10 years after that of drugs and gang violence, heroin and, and, and crystal meth that my older boy had lost his mind. I got to see beyond. Why? Because in challenges is when faith is real. 
It's during challenges you find out whether God's really cemented something into you or not. Can you say amen? amen? And here's what I know. We might not know what our circumstances will be, but we know a God that's bigger than our circumstances. And although sometimes our circumstances are unstable, it doesn't mean we have to be unstable with them. The faith can bring about stability we never knew we'd have. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 47 48. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and breaks against the house, it stands firm because it is well built. So for those of you that, that are struggling and you're like, I don't understand. I gave my heart to God and I'm doing the right thing and all these storms are still coming. The Bible never promised when you come to Jesus you won't have storms. It's just he promises he'll give you the strength to overcome that if you build on a solid foundation, the same storm that collapsed the person who built on the sand who didn't build on a solid life, they will fall apart. Their life will end. But somehow, some way, you'll see beyond. You'll go through it, and you'll come out on the other side better than when you went into the storm. That's the God we serve. That's the God I know. That's what it means to see beyond. Come on, everyone say see beyond. And here's the last thing we have to do. Number three, filter it correctly. Come on, I would say filter it correctly. Okay, let's try a little truth serum in church. We're in church. You can be honest, can't you? In church. How many can say on Instagram or Facebook or some social media, somewhere you may have used a little filter? Yeah. Some of you are like, I ain't admitting either way. I have. I have. I, 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 one time I ran into a board, boom, and I had a big old bruise right here, and I went in and poof, took it out. <laughs> Come on, y'all with me? I lost 30 pounds in one picture. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend get hold of me. Man, what you been doing working out? I'm like, no, nah, I found a good filter, bro. <laughs> a, a V-back, arms like this. Teeth were white. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Filter, right? Uh, I love photography. I travel the world. I have a nice camera. I love taking different shots and different lighting with different filters. But, but my greatest lesson to filters ever was in Alaska. My wife and I have been blessed to go to Alaska every year for the last 20 years. We keep getting invited back to the same uh, conference in Alaska. We're there two weeks in July, which is cool because I'm living in Arizona. And it's hotter than <laughs> over there. And, and, and so... Uh, and so I'm out fishing with this guy. He, he knows the river. He knows the area. And we're fishing. And sure enough, I'm out fishing. I'm throwing my pole out. And, you know, you just throw it out. It floats along. You pull it through. You do the same thing over and over. You pull it through. And, you know, they jerk at it. You catch a fish. And, and so I'm out there 30 minutes, nothing, 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 nothing. If you, if you don't know anything about me, know this. I get bored with anything after 30 minutes. Come on, y'all with me? I mean, you name it, it's like 30 minutes. we got to change something up here. And so I'm like, bro, there's no fish in here. He goes, oh, no, they're here. They're just a little further out. Just so you line a little further out. So I went a little further out, and about three casts, boom, caught one. You know, in an hour, I caught my limit. I was like, oh, that's cool. We went back to the river a few days later, same place. I'm like, this is going to be fun. I know where the fish are at. I'm throwing to the same spot. And nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm like, bro, the fish are gone. No, they're right up closer, just so any closer. I'm like, Okay, so I think closer, man, just boom, boom, start catching fish. I said, bro, you're so good. How do you do that? He walked over and took his sunglasses off and put them on and went, oh, I can see the fish. <laughs> I thought he's like a magic fisherman, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, that's Alaska man. I thought he had superpowers, you know. No, he had filtered sunglasses that took the glare away, and you could actually see the salmon swimming. You know what I did? I learned a lesson, so I went and bought myself some sunglasses. <laughs> so every time I go to the river, I can see the fish. Now when I take a guest with me, there's no fish in there. Oh, yeah, let me show you. Come here. Come here. The fish are right there. Just so right there. Now I look so smart. I'm not telling anyone about my glasses. <laughs> I got to be known about being smart about something. No, no, but it's filters. It's the, it's the way you see things. He didn't have any advantage I didn't have or couldn't have. I just had to get the right lens. No one has an advantage over you. Life isn't set up harder for you than anyone else. With my story, it's not harder than some people's story. Some people didn't have it as hard. Some people had it harder. 
It's not a matter of what the level of toughness is. It's a matter of the level of your faith and how you view it. Your perspective and my perspective can either be, there's giants, it's scary, it's terrible. Or we can look through the eyes of faith and we can say, you know what? That giant right there is the breakfast of champions. I'm going, to have that, I'm going to have that giant right there for breakfast this morning. It's like the difference between the Israel children and when they faced Goliath. Remember the story? And they hid. They were hiding. And David showed up. He said, I'll fight him. Why? Because the Israel children's like, he's too big for us to beat. David said, he's too big. He's too freaking big for me to miss. That's why the Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. They come in and irritate you daily, and you might notice that. You might not notice that, but giants, they're too big to miss. We can take care of giants because we carry the spirit of Almighty God. Come on, everyone say, God lives in me. Come on, look at someone and say, God lives in you. I love this. When we start to believe God's word, we'll start to believe there's nothing too big for us. Right? Look to the filter of faith. What if the only filter we become concerned with is the God filter? That we see ourselves as God sees us. We, are, we see our circumstances as God sees it. Come on, y'all with me. Look at this in Jeremiah 29. If you want to know how God sees our lives, 29, 11 through 13. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. What filter are we viewing our situation through? Hmm. Are we looking through the filter of defeat, loss, despair, fear? Or will we look again through the eyes of faith as God sees our life? Write this down in your notes. I love this statement. The God filter is the only one that allows us to see what our physical eyes cannot Scripture, I think you've been using this series. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. We set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. I'm going to show you how this works. What we see will last just a short time, but what we cannot see will last forever. I want to say what we see. Do you know we put our faith in things we see all the time? There's probably not one person in here that went to sit down in that chair that you first tested to see if it would hold you up. And I have to be honest with you, I'd probably laugh if it happened. Because I've had that happen to me. As a pastor, we have to replace chairs all the time. You don't even think about it. You just sit down. Trusting something you can see. It's what you can't see that gets you though, isn't it? Now I'm going to show you how to do this. Everyone do me a favor and point at something invisible right now. Go ahead. Point at something invisible. What are you pointing? You're not pointing at anything. It doesn't make sense. You can't point at the invisible because you can't see the invisible. Now, everybody close your eyes. Come on, everybody just close your eyes for a moment. Just play along with me. Close your eyes. I want you to see your future. I want you to see your marriage the way you want it 10 years from now. I want you to see that relationship you've been praying about. I want you to see that business you've launched, how you're going to see it in five years. I want you to see your family. I want you to see that baby grow up. I want you to see your baby having babies and what that child's going to look like. I want you to see what it looks like when your life ends and you walk through heaven's gate. I want you to begin to understand when you see Jesus, what's that going to be like? And everybody open your eyes. You could see those things, couldn't you? Although it's not happened yet, you can see it because you don't see it with your physical eye. You see it with the spiritual eye through the lens of God. You see it because God gave you the imagination to see through faith the things that are not as though they were. And that's exactly how God calls us to live. He calls us to see things with our eyes closed that we can't see with our eyes open. That what God planted in our heart, they don't come by. Unless we have the correct filter, we'll never see the things that are not as though they were. Can you say amen? Amen. I think it's, in in fact, one of the hardest things to learn. Uh, Let me tell you another thing. Seven years after we lost our son. We got a phone call. And the phone call said, your son Austin, he was two years older than the twins. He's now 18. The twins were, the one that survived was 16. Your son Austin's been in an accident. 
And we thought, well, let's go down and see what's going on, see if the car is all right. You know how you just kind of process through things, make sure he's okay. We get to the hospital, and it was one of the busiest hospitals in Phoenix, fifth largest city in the nation, and probably over 100 people in the waiting room. And as we walk in, they say, Mr. and Mrs. Goff, come with us, and they pull us into the side room. We know that's not good news because we'd seen that before. As we walked in the room, they said, you have to understand your son was hit in a car in a truck by a drunk driver doing 80 miles an hour. The three, the three people in that pickup died instantly. The three in your son's pickup aren't doing well, and your son was catapulted through the windshield, and he fell face first into a parking lot McDonald's. His brain's bleeding in about 26 or 27 places. It doesn't look good. As we walked into the as we walked into the room, I'll never forget, they told us this story. And when they told us this story, I remember, and I try, I try to share this without getting broke up still, because I remember my wife broke down and she started screaming, not again, not again, I can't go through this again. And my twin boy that had survived the accident, he walked out of the room mad. And he said, where's God, Dad? Where is God in all this? What kind of lens do you think I had to look through? What kind of lens do you think came upon this pastor's heart at that moment? When once again, seven years later, we're going through the same tragedy that we went through seven years earlier. What kind of lens do you think gave me the faith to look at my wife and say, you're right, not this time, it's not going to happen. What kind of lens do you think I had to put on to look at my son who was 16 years old, doubting God to say, son, I just got to believe once again it's going to be all right. I know last time we prayed and it didn't work, but we're going to pray again and we're going to believe. I don't know why, but this time my son lived. He now runs the marriage ministry with our daughter-in-law and their, our campus pastor at our original campus. I, I, I don't know. I do know that the Bible says this in Matthew 6, 22. It says, if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. And that scripture bothered me for a long time. Why does it say if your eye is single instead of if your eyes are single, plural, because I have two eyes. If your eye is single... Your whole body will be full of light or will be enlightened. Well, it just bothered me so much I had to study it, right? Well, although we have two eyes, we have one eyesight. Line of sight is one eye. They work in conjunction. One eye goes, the other eye tracks. That's how it works. If not, it's proven it's because someone has a neurological problem in their mind. It's called convergence insufficiency. One eye tracks the other eye won't go, and it gives double vision or blurred vision. So now let's relate to the scripture. If your eye is single, your whole body will be enlightened, meaning you'll live a life that's correct. If spiritually you have one eye in Jesus, but the other eye is looking at your past and still feeling guilty, you've got spiritual convergence insufficiency. If you've got one eye on Jesus and the righteousness of who he is, but your other eye, it tends to go over to the computer and pornography, you've got spiritual convergence insufficiency. If you've got one eye on Jesus on Sunday morning, but you were in the club last night raising the roof, I'm not saying you can't have fun in life. God knows wherever I go, it's a party. Life's not boring with Jesus. Come on. <laughs> if your life's boring, you need to get a new Jesus. Because I was a heck of a sinner. Right? Don't look at me like that, judgy. Oh, y'all judgy. I sinned with the best. I was a great sinner. I'm just going to be a better Christian. I, I have more fun as a Christian. But if you got one eye trying to focus, why are you giving your eyes Opposite minds or separate minds. If any mind is in Christ, let this mind that is Christ be in you. Why are you letting this eye have the mind of Christ and this eye have the mind of your flesh? The Bible says in Romans 12 too, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why are you renewing your mind? So you look one place, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Set your eyes upon the things above, not the things of earth. Not one eye on heaven, one eye on earth. I want to go, but I want to stay. I want to go. No, you're all weird-eyed. 
we got a little girl in our church right now going through this. Surgeries. Because she has convergence, insufficiency in Goodyear. Her little eye just roams and they're correcting it little by little. Some of you need corrective surgery in your spiritual life. You're, 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 you're insecure. You're having difficult. In fact, let me say it this way. You're inconsistent and it drives you crazy in your spiritual life. Why am I so inconsistent? Because you're not seeing through, you're not seeing through single eyes. You're inconsistent because you're insufficient in your convergence upon Jesus. Come on, y'all with me? So that's my prayer today, that you just decide to get your eyes focused upon who he is. That's the only way you can face day-to-day challenges and see beyond. You'll never see beyond. Paul said, this one thing I do, this one thing I do, one thing. Everyone say single. single. One thing I do, looking ahead. Forgetting that which is behind, I look ahead. Forgetting that which is behind, I look ahead. To the mark, the prize, the high calling of Jesus Christ. You're not inconsistent. You're just not looking the same place with both eyes. God has you. You just got to get him in focus. Can you say amen? amen? Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace, your goodness. God, I pray that every person here would begin to know just how much you love them.